So all year we're focusing on the greatness of God. And today we get to finish a sermon series called The Supremacy of Christ. And for the past six weeks we've been saying, I think really for the past 10 years we've been saying, but for the past six weeks in the series at least we've been saying that the Christian gospel claims that Jesus is far greater than anyone or anything else ever. And now it's true that his first coming into the world was marked by humility and suffering and even death on a cross. But we've said that is not how Jesus remains today. Jesus has risen from the dead. He has ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus reigns and rules over all of creation today, even now. And today we get to consider his return in glory to judge the living and the dead. So during the past few years of dealing with COVID and and many other difficult things that we've lived through, it became clear to me that far too many Christians have way too small of a vision of who God is. It's one of the reasons why we're focusing on the greatness of God all year. And it's true that if we fail to get this vision of Jesus high and lifted up as he truly is today, supreme over all, then we'll have all sorts of problems in our life and in our faith. So in this series, we've considered a number of ways that Jesus is far greater than anyone or anything. But now, today, we will look at ahead to things which are yet to come, to the end of time, to the end of this age of sin and struggle and death. A few weeks ago, we heard the promise of the angels at the ascension of Jesus back into heaven, saying that one day he would return in the same way. So what will that day be like? What will happen in that day when the king of heaven returns? Well, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, please take it and open it to Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 11. Revelation 20, verse 11. It's right at the end of your Bible. You can start at the end and work your way back a few pages if you'd like. We will also put the scripture on the screens for you as well. Revelation 20, verse 11. Let's read. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it, The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is God's word. Earlier this year, we finished uh, our series, Encounters with God, by considering the Apostle John's encounter with the risen Christ on the island of Patmos toward the end of his life. He was living in exile there for his ministry in the gospel. And just as the ancient Israelites needed this incredibly vivid prophetic image, uh, imagery from Ezekiel and Daniel when they were in exile, so John and the early Christians needed, I believe, John's vivid imagery of this cosmic battle between good and evil, which is found here in Revelation. Now, the book of Revelation is really unique in the Bible because it's written in the Jewish apocalyptic literary style, which we don't have anymore. So it's for this reason, I suspect, and perhaps because at least some of the events in Revelation describe things which are yet to come in the future, perhaps both of these reasons are why this book is so difficult for Christians to interpret and why there are so many views and theories and frameworks of understanding these things yet to come in the return of Christ. Now, as such, it can be very difficult to know from the text whether certain things here that John is describing are meant to be taken literal or figurative or physical or spiritual in nature or some combination of the two. Now, I believe that John, from John's gospel account, in the New Testament and from his letters or epistles in the New Testament that John is perhaps the most poetic of the apostles. Uh, It's not a widely believed, but it is my personal theory. John is a poet. 
Uh, if so, then surely God would use his artistic sensibilities for our benefit. But in approaching Revelation, just as we might approach any other prophetic work in the Old Testament, we must proceed with caution. A, a good biblical interpretation principle would be to speak loudly on the things on which the Bible is clear and to allow some measure of mystery or maybe some respectful disagreement on things which are not yet clear to us. Okay? Deal? Can we proceed? Yeah. Okay, amen. Thank you. I will proceed. Let's go back to verse 11 and work through this together. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. Okay, let's pause right here. So in this passage, it's not exactly clear from right here if John is seeing God the Father or Jesus the Son on the white throne of heaven. Since there is one God with ultimate glory and authority, either the person of the Father or the person of the Son would be appropriate, but I believe that it is, in fact, Jesus who is here seated on the throne. And my reasoning is in the very next passage after our text, uh, the one who is on the throne is described as the Alpha and the Omega, which means it represents the beginning and the end. And, in, and this title is only used of Jesus by John in his revelation. In Revelation 19, Jesus is depicted as this mighty warrior who conquers Satan and all the forces of evil. And he is seated here on the great white throne. So what is the significance of the throne, do you think? Well, I believe that the white throne is a symbol of both the righteousness and the justice of heaven, and it reflects the holy beauty of a perfect God. God is light, John would write. In him there is no darkness at all. The throne gives us these many images to consider. But in the glorious presence of the king and creator God, all of creation seems to be displaced. Christ has so much glory that there is no room for anyone else or anything else beside him. I think that this is what it means when John says that the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. Now, does this describe the physical destruction of our current universe, the current creation? We know that God had, has promised to make a new heaven and a new earth. In fact, in the very next passage in Revelation 21, John has a vision of this new heaven and new earth. So perhaps, yes, this is the moment of the great transition, the, the end of our current age and the beginning of the new age of eternity. Well, let's continue with verse 12. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books, the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. So, first of all, if you're familiar with the Old Testament scripture in the Bible, this whole passage should, should be ringing a bunch of bells in your, in your mind and your memory of the Old Testament. This whole passage should remind us of Daniel's vision of the throne room of heaven in Daniel chapter 7, a very famous passage where we get the title of Jesus, which is Son of Man. There in Daniel 7, there is one who is called the Ancient of Days who is seated on the throne and books were opened. Very similar in language. Now, I believe that John had this exact passage in mind when he recorded this vision because there are a number of surely intentional links in the language that John uses pointing back to the language of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7. But what exactly is John describing here? Well, this, I believe, is judgment day. This is the day when every single person who has ever lived, everyone from Adam and Eve on down to you and I, on through to every soul that will come after us. We will all stand before the throne of Christ and give an account of our lives to him. All of the dead will be raised to life, John says, wherever their bodies came to rest. Now, he mentions a few different places, whether it was uh, in the sea or on land, uh, death and Hades or the grave, wherever 
people have died, whatever their manner of death, no matter whether they were richly entombed and greatly mourned or whether they were lost and forgotten. Every man and woman, rich and poor, great and small, John says, will stand before their maker. And each one of us will be judged according to what we have done in life. Now, of course, it's not only John who teaches this coming day. This is a thread that runs through the whole Bible. God says through the prophet Jeremiah, I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind to reward each person according to their conduct, according to what their deeds deserve. Or listen to the prophet Daniel who wrote, multitudes will sleep in the dust of the earth, will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. Or listen to Jesus who taught his disciples, do not be amazed at this for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Finally, just a few of many, the Apostle Paul writes, quote, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due to do us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now I know that we modern people hate the idea of judgment. We love the idea of justice, but we hate judgment. Now, this is, of course, an incoherent contradiction because you cannot have justice without some sort of judgment. But the reason I share so many examples of this teaching running Old Test through the Old Testament and the New Testament in the Bible is so that you wouldn't be tempted to move on quickly, as I am, and ignore this doctrine of justice and judgment. Now, we don't know the timing of the return of Christ. And despite an ocean of ink spilled on the topic, we probably don't have all the details of his return figured out either. But one thing the Bible is very clear on and something that we should not hesitate to be clear on ourselves is that Jesus will return, the dead will be raised, and all will stand before him to give an account of our lives. We are not our own. It's one of the reasons why we hate this teaching. Because we want to be beholden to no one but ourselves. But we are creatures who have been made by a creator. And it is his right and his right alone to assess whether we have lived how we ought to have lived or not. So let's finish this passage with verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Now first, here, death and Hades, or what is known as the grave, probably more accurately, the place of the dead for us, these are personified and thrown into the lake of fire. John says that this lake of fire is the second death or the final death because the very next passage says that death and mourning and crying and pain is all these things are part of the old order which has passed away. Which means that this age of illness and aging and dying will not continue forever. This age of war and decay and destruction will one day come to an end. Praise God. I can't wait for that day. But secondly, and terribly, John says that anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire as well. Now the book of life is also called the Lamb's book of life in Revelation. When his disciples came back from a little missionary trip, they went out sharing good news in groups of two, telling people about who Jesus was and the kingdom of God that was coming near. When they came back, they were 
they were really excited about everything that they saw God had done. Jesus responded, he said, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Having your name written in the Lamb's book of life is the same thing as being born again or having a relationship with God by faith in the person and work of Jesus. As John famously wrote in his gospel, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The death that John referred to in his gospel is the death that is mentioned here, the second death of hell. The opposite of eternal life might be called eternal death. It's a full separation from creatures and their creator. Now, this, the picture here of this sad reality is one of fire, which is a picture, a metaphor. Throughout the Bible, several images for this future reality are used, some of which even seem to contradict each other. In some places, this place of judgment is described as darkness, while other places, it's described as fire, which obviously has some sort of light involved. What I think is going on here is similar to what we in, uh, saw in our Encounters with God series as well. These are biblical authors trying to use earthly language to describe a spiritual reality. Now, fire is also a metaphor in the Bible, um, a, a picture of refining. Does this mean that after a time of punishment or refining, that these people might be released? The truth is, is that God only knows. Of course, we trust in the goodness and the mercy of God, but we are not given any indication of this from his word. So what do we say about such things? What hope is there for any of us on that great and terrible day of judgment? Well, there are many things to say. I'm going to close this morning with two. First, there's this I think curious detail that John mentions about the books. Some of you might have been thinking, does God really need a book to remember the details of someone's life? Isn't that weird? Would it be like a hard drive or something or some future tech? Well, the answer is no, of course not. God does not need a book. He is infinite in wisdom and knowledge. He is omniscient, meaning he knows all things, and he is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere all the time. Therefore... He knows not only the things that we have said and done, but also every thought and motive of the human heart. The books are a metaphor for this divine knowledge. But do you know what this means? The perfect knowledge of God means that he will also be the perfect judge. Even the best human judge cannot understand every extenuating circumstance that led up to a thought or word or deed. No human judge, even if they are of the best education and are very experienced and are very wise themselves, there is no human judge that can fully understand every thought and motive of the human heart. We can barely understand what's going on in our own hearts most of the time, much less perfectly judge someone else. We should want God to be our judge. For no one else will ensure that justice will truly be done. But this means that in the end, evil will not win. Justice will be done. Every time when it seems as if someone has gotten away with some terrible evil, every time someone has sinned against you and maybe wounded you incredibly deeply and you don't feel like they really ever understood what they did. They were never repentant or they never came back to make things right. We can take comfort in the fact that one day they too will stand before the Lord and every wrong will be set to right. Praise God. This is something very helpful to remember when you are deeply wounded by someone's sin against you. 
But it's not necessarily comforting when you consider your own sin, right? I don't know if any, any one of us is excited to think about standing before the Lord to give an account of our lives, other people's lives, definitely. God, bring justice to bear on them. But please be gracious to me. Please be merciful. Just let me skip that part of this process. So what do we say about our sin? What about our judgment? Well, now we say it all the time. Nobody's perfect. We can pretty easily admit to that. And it's true. Not one of us has, has perfectly loved the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not, not a single one of us has perfectly loved our, our neighbor, our brother, our sister, our father, our mother, our spouse, our coworker, our friend, like we would love ourselves. In fact, there, I don't think there's a single person who has ever lived who has even met their own internal standard of right and wrong. I violate my conscious of what is right and wrong on kind of a regular basis. How will any of us stand before the throne of Christ? Well, we've all already seen from John chapter 2 that the judge is also the Savior. The good news of the gospel is that the one who is seated on the great white throne of judgment is also the one who stepped down out of heaven, down into this world to seek and to save the lost. It is the perfect judge who ultimately gave his life facing the hell of the cross so that anyone might be welcomed into heaven. Believing in, in Jesus results in a great exchange, one where Jesus takes on our sin and even our death, and we receive the gift of righteousness and his life. So please hear this invitation. Be reconciled to God. Give your sins and your struggles to him. He's not just waiting to the end of time to make you pay. He's already paid the price with his death on the cross. If you do, if you do believe in him, if you do trust him, you have nothing to fear on that future day. That promise is very clear. For when you stand before the throne, your sin will not be on display, but rather the righteousness of Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul, working through as a lawyer the logic of the gospel in his letter to the Romans, he culminates with the logic of the gospel in Romans chapter 8, saying, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not yesterday, not today, not in that future day. On that day, you will not be shamed, guilted, or punished, but welcomed as a friend and a brother or a sister because of the glorious grace of God. And the one with all the glory and all the authority of heaven, the one before whom the heavens and the earth flee in his presence, he will be the one who wipes every tear from your eye. So turn to him today while there is still time and receive him today. Welcome him with joy and thanksgiving as the Savior and the Lord of your life. He will never leave you he will never forsake you. And he will reveal himself, I promise, to be greater than anyone or anything, both now and forevermore. To him be all glory, honor, and praise. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you have humbled us with your word We look to you and we find ourselves looking high and lifted up all the way to the great white throne of heaven, a 
a throne of justice and judgment, severe and terrible in one sense, but lovely and beautiful, worthy of all honor and praise. Lord Jesus, would you help us to live in light of this future reality? Would you help us to see that what we do and what we say really matters to you? But ultimately, Lord, there is hope for all of us, every single one of us who would call on your name. The offer of salvation is wide open. God, I pray for my friends here that they would take it, that we would trust in you, that we would lean into your life and your grace, and your love, that we would enjoy the freedom that comes with all of those things. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.